All right, welcome back. This is the shortest time period that we're covering, maybe for the entire thing, the entire uh, overview we're doing here, protesters and defenders from 1500 to 1544. This is a really action-packed period of time that changed the history of Christianity, perhaps more than any other period uh, since maybe the mustard seed. Um, okay, so what's happening here? Well, we just finished the Avignon Papacy, the Western Papal Schism, a lot of that stuff happening there. Culturally, you had the rest, the Renaissance, excuse me. Uh, so a lot of things important uh, that are happening in Europe. All right, so what's happening then in 1500 to 1544? Well, this is the period, of course, of the Protestant Reformation or Protestant Revolt, depending on how you look at it. Uh, it was definitely a revolt against the church's authority. So what's the build up to this? Well, that includes, of course, the office of the Pope and the authority of the Pope being weakened by the Avignon Papacy and the Western Schism and the heresy of conciliarism, even though that gets condemned at the end of the 15th century or towards the middle of it, rather. Um, the papacy is still not quite as strong or as uh, uh, respected as it was during the Middle Ages. You get abuses within the church too. So worldly and wealthy bishops collecting benefices, which are special incomes attached to their office. Uh, you get uh, indulgences uh, being sold. Okay. So a coin in the coffer releasing uh, souls from purgatory or uh, getting you straight to heaven after you die, right? So indulgences are time off of purgatory, essentially, or more technically removing the temporal punishment due to our sins. Uh, and then the spread of superstition and witchcraft. Uh, bishops and abbots of monasteries were selling the offices of bishop or, um, or abbot, which is uh, simony. Okay, it's a, a sacrilege. And then nepotism would be... Um, worldly rulers, let's say, a uh, secular ruler appointing his son to be the bishop in his diocese or something like that. So it's uh, favoriting somebody who's in your, favoring somebody who's in your family. Okay. Uh, Jan Hus and John Wycliffe, uh, I mentioned them as heretics who kind of planted the seeds for the Protestant Reformation, including the idea of sola scriptura, rejecting uh, church councils, things like that. So they were executed as heretics, but their ideas do spread throughout Europe a bit. And then nationalism. So uh, nations which have previously been united by their common faith in uh, Christianity and the church, they now want to gain more independence from the influence of the church and from each other. So this is all happening as Martin Luther pops up. Martin Luther then, uh, early 16th century, comes out uh, develops this theology, including the four solas. Okay, so sola fide, this idea that we are justified by faith alone, good works, penance, those play no role whatsoever in writing our relationship with God. Sola scriptura, that idea that scripture is the sole authority for what we should believe. In other words, the Pope and church councils have basically no authority and in fact have gotten things wrong in the past. Okay. Uh, so private interpretation of scripture is the only authority. Sola gratia, which is grace alone, uh, basically negating the cooperation of our will. Okay, so saying that anything we do is the direct result of sanctifying grace or saving grace and that our wills actually don't play any part in that at all. We can't even cooperate with grace. Okay, it's something a little more towards being mechanistic. Okay, I mean, God is doing things without our cooperation. And then solo Christo. So Christ alone, he's the only mediator of salvation. He's the sole content of revelation and our faith. Okay, which isn't so far from the truth, that last one. All right, Ulrich Zwingli then, actually in Switzerland, lesser known reformer, even more radical than Luther. He and Luther got together and they disagreed. Luther thought that the Eucharist was legitimately a sacrament although he believed a slightly different thing than Catholics do. Zwingli more radically says, no, the Eucharist is purely symbolic. It's just communion. The Lord's Supper, Jesus is not present in any way, shape, or form, or at least not in any special way in that Lord's Supper. Okay, He actually takes over, tries to take over Switzerland. Uh, so he literally wars against the church physically as well as ideologically. Uh, destroys images and statues, so he's a big iconoclast. 
and he denies all the sacraments. He ends up getting killed in a battle, actually. He's a, he's a priest who can't keep celibacy, ends up getting married, and then becoming a soldier. John Calvin, uh, another famous guy, he's kind of a second generation reformer, but he sets up what's called a theocracy in Geneva, where the church is actually in charge of the government. And uh, he develops his own theology in Switzerland. And then King Henry VIII, the final piece here. So Henry uh, sets himself up as the head of the church in England, which gives birth to the Church of England, uh, a.k.a. the Anglican Church. So Anglicanism, as well as its offshoots like Episcopalianism, uh, come from Henry VIII there. On the positive side, we get St. Ignatius of Loyola writing his spiritual exercises and establishing the Society of Jesus, a.k.a. the Jesuits. Okay. Oh, and Our Lady appears to St. Juan Diego at Guadalupe. This is the apparition known as Our Lady of Guadalupe, which literally leads to millions of conversions of Native Americans. Okay, Uh, that happens in 1531. All right, go ahead and pause, answer question one. All right, so here we have our major reformers, Martin Luther on the far left, Ulrich Zwingli, the Swiss, Reformer in the center left, center right is John Calvin, Frenchman, and then Henry VIII, the King of England on the far right. Okay. Major events here. So 1517 is the day when Martin Luther posted the year when he posted his 95 theses, which were not a list of Protestant theological positions, but um, propositions that he wished to debate publicly. Okay. This is before he split from the church formally and all of that. So he posts these theses, wants public debate, in 1517. All right, a series of events happens. He gets some debates and is revealed to be a heretic. And then there's an assembly or a diet of Worms. It's at Worms in Germany. And there he is, he basically confesses, yes, you know, I I deny all of these teachings of the church. I deny the authority of the church, the authority of the Pope. I think the Pope is the Antichrist and yada, yada, yada. He's condemned to death as a heretic, but he actually escapes and comes under the protection of Duke Frederick of Saxony. So, of course, he does not die there. The following year, completely unrelated, Ignatius of Loyola, he has his conversion experience in 1521, and then uh, through his experience in the cave at Manresa, if you know anything about him, he spent a year in a cave, he writes these spiritual exercises, and he's all the way down in Spain. Okay, So he may or may not have been aware of Luther and everything going on with him. 1530, then, you get what's called the Augsburg Confession. Uh, This is an outline of the major points of Lutheran theology. So by 1530, Luther has worked out his points in more detail, and a guy named Philip Melanchthon has actually systematized them, ordered them, organized them, and shown how they fit together. He writes the Augsburg Confession. This is still an authoritative uh, document in Lutheran tradition. The following year, a couple things happen. Ulrich Zwingli is killed in battle as he's battling the Catholic cantons or regions in Switzerland. And then also, this is when Mary appears to St. Juan Diego in Guadalupe, triggering the conversion and baptism of millions of Native Americans. So Mexico becomes Catholic because of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Well, I hope to talk about this more towards the end of the semester. A few years later, 1534, English Parliament passes what's known as the Act of Supremacy uh, at the behest of King Henry VIII. Of course, Henry wanted a, an annulment from Catherine of Aragon so he could marry Anne Boleyn. The Pope said no, and so he ends up getting Parliament to pass the Act of Supremacy, which makes him the king, the supreme head of the church in England, Okay, instead of the Pope. This is the schism between Uh, the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of England, the Anglican Church, 1534. That same year, St. Ignatius and his companions, we'll talk more about them tomorrow, they established the Society of Jesus, okay, the Jesuit order. They become very influential for hundreds of years, they're still around. 1536, then a couple years later, is when John Calvin publishes his Institutes of the Christian Religion, which is his systematic uh, work of theology that basically lays out the theology for Calvinists. Uh, that gets refined here and there, Okay, but the Presbyterians are an offshoot of Calvinism. Uh, you've also got Baptists who are influenced by John Calvin. All right, 
And then the end of this decade, 1535 to 1540, is what's called the dissolution of the monasteries. What happens in England after the Act of Supremacy, Henry then technically owns or claims to own all of the church property, property in England. He destroys all the monasteries in England, takes everything there and sells it. And so he takes all of this money and basically puts it in the royal treasury, and he kicks the monks and the nuns out. This is financially bad, but it also is just culturally disastrous because the monasteries had been in England since uh, the 6th century, right? It was 597 that Augustine of Canterbury came and uh, basically converted England. So 10,000 people baptized on Christmas Day in 597. So almost a thousand years that monasteries had been a really important part of English culture and English society. Now they are gone. All right, go ahead and pause and answer question two. All right, so you can see ruins of some monasteries in England, hey Charlie, uh, that were destroyed in 1539. So you can go visit all of these ruins uh, to this day. All right, and then major people and saints. Just gonna pause recording. All right, resuming the recording here. Okay, major people, saints, whoops, spoiler alert. So this is just kind of a summary, right? We've already talked about almost all of these people. Okay, so the reformers, of course, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, and Henry VIII. Uh, Pope Leo X is the one who ends up excommunicating Martin Luther after the Diet of Worms uh, or around that time because he is openly heretical at that point uh, and he refuses to recant his heresy. So Leo excommunicates him. Philip Melanchthon, I mentioned, is the guy who systematized Luther's theology and wrote the Augsburg Confession. Ignatius of Loyola, I mentioned, wrote the spiritual exercises, set up the Society of Jesus, which becomes very important later on, especially in missionary activity. Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn are the first two of Henry's wives. He had multiple, ended up beheading most of them. Uh, Thomas Cranmer and Thomas Cromwell are Henry VIII's right-hand men. So Cranmer becomes Archbishop of Canterbury and basically does whatever Henry wants. Cromwell is kind of the political maneuverer who uh, also works to do whatever Henry wants. Uh, St. John Fisher is an English bishop who was executed. He was martyred for refusing to uh, go along with the act of supremacy. And then St. Thomas More is not a clergyman. He is a married layman who becomes Lord Chancellor of England, who's actually very good friends with Henry VIII, but he ends up getting executed for, again, refusing to go along with the act of supremacy. So those are two early English martyrs. There are thousands more who follow after them. Go ahead, do answer question three, and then you know the drill. All right, so pick one of these guys and give me a paragraph summary. All right, so we'll talk about the Catholic Counter-Reformation tomorrow. And that will wrap up this week's units. That will put us into the 1700s. All right, thanks.